Hello and welcome to the EMS Nation podcast. We're your hosts, Faison Arshad. And I'm Chris Fuligar. All right, Faison. So this next one we've saved the best for last, in my opinion. This talk is entitled Push Dose Pressors and Push Dose Nitroglycerin by none other than our very own Faison Arshad. Thank you so much for that warm introduction, Chris. This was such a fun lecture to give. I harnessed my inner motivational speaker to deliver this catechol surging lecture. No pun intended, actually 100% pun intended. Push dose pressors as well as push dose nitroglycerin. And the concepts in this lecture are not new, but the approach and the application within the pre-hospital space is something that is newer and nuanced, but certainly within our ALS scope of practice, so worth exploring. And in regards to the theme of this 2017 EMS week for EMS Nation, where we focused on the advanced airway, resuscitation, human factors, this talk really focused on your critically ill patients that required advanced airway management. And it's really not the skill or the procedure that saves lives, but it's that medical decision-making in the pre-hospital space which saves lives. So I started the talk by focusing in on the hop killers, hemodynamics, insufficient oxygenation, as well as pH, and using things which we commonly have access to, mainly epinephrine, to create a diluted concentration of push dose presser to resuscitate our patient before they're given a dose of sedatives and paralytics of course, because we know post-intubation hypotension occurs in up to 25% of folks who are RSI, and in fact, the pericardiac arrest rate related to RSI is anywhere from 2 to 5%. So we have our sickest patients. It really behooves us to optimize our resuscitation sequence intubation so that we can really, really ensure that there's no transient hypoxia, hypotension, as Bill Hinckley is fond of saying, dash 1a the definitive airway sans hypoxia and hypotension in the first attempt i think that it is so very important and what you touched on is the art of medical decision making and that can be so difficult sometimes to teach and convey to newer providers but that art is something that is honed and developed over time after seeing many many patients and i was extremely motivated by attending this lecture and there were times in which i was not sure if i was listening to dr arshad or tony robbins it was really so good i really enjoyed this and i'm sure that you will too as i said in my opinion we're saving the best for last and enjoy this next talk push dose pressors and push dose nitroglycerin push dose pressors all right so how many folks, just by raise, raising your hands, have heard of this concept, the laryngoscope, as a murder weapon? <laughs> right? We have all heard of this. Why? Because we took an oath. Do no harm. But also, we are resuscitationists, which means we want to take the best care possible of our patients and our patient population. Right? But nevertheless, we have to balance the risks and the benefits. So the laryngoscope as a murder weapon has been a concept that's been extensively spoken about on social media. And really the uh, caveats or the learning points are we can do better. The reason we get paid to do what we do is high quality medical decision making. No patients are the same, but nevertheless, we are responsible for recognizing clues based on signs and symptoms, uh, hemodynamics, understanding the inherent physiology underlying our patient's uh, morbidities, right? So do no harm. Now, I have to thank Dr. Shepard because he primed you guys sort of inception-like, he striking resemblance to Leonardo DiCaprio on that note. Um, <laughs> resuscitation sequence intubation, right? We have to take control of our own profession and redefine RSI. It's 2017, there should be no such thing as a crash intubation. Rapid, sin rapid sequence intubation is a misnomer, right? Especially when dealing, perhaps in the, in the OR, with control patients who have been fasting and have very few comorbidities, but the type of practice that we have is unpredictable. 
Patients can present. We have no idea. We start a shift. We start a tour. We have no idea what is going to ensue on that day, right? So medical decision-making has to be foremost and tantamount in our thought process. So resuscitate before you intubate. It has been a term that's been coined by Dr. Rich Levitam, who tweets under airway cam. Uh, we have to be judicious in our use of sedatives so that the procedure is non-distressing as possible, but we also have to be mindful of our patient's hemodynamics and not compromise safety. The primary objective is to keep the patient alive while achieving intubation, and that's been sort of a theme uh, throughout the conference. So when we talk about preparing for an intubation, oftentimes people will say, it's really important to check your own pulse before you try and perform a critical procedure. I know my uh, fantastic brothers in arms were talking all about logistics and procedures in HEMS, but it's really important to take your own pulse before you initiate on this uh, algorithm. And uh, inherent in that process, we talk about sphincter tone tightening euphemistically. However, uh, fight, flight, freeze is something that's quite real. And I've noticed in myself when I'm approaching a challenging airway, my heart rate will almost always rise, right? So what do we do to mitigate that? A simple trick that I want to just tell you guys is to smile. Right? Why does smiling work? It activates our parasympathetic nervous system, which can be incredibly powerful. Imagine, right? We have evolved two million years of humanity, right? Fight, flight, freeze is a survival mechanism. Evolution has built this into us. You're in a room with a saber-toothed tiger. I'm going to be fighting or fleeing or frozen, right? But if you smile, that will inherently counteract that uh, mechanism. Now, a uh, fantastic mentor, a brilliant mind in resuscitation as well as HEMS, has coined the term Dash 1A, and we were just chatting briefly in 2008. And he was way, way, way ahead of his time. The research is just coming to fruition that is proving this to be such an important concept within resuscitation, especially approaching the advanced airway. So we know this mnemonic, definitive airway, sans, hypoxia, and hypotension, right? And that's really what our focus is going to be today, is the hypotension aspect of advanced airway management. And of course, uh, ideally, we want to do this on the first attempt. However, as Dr. Hinckley was telling uh, me just a brief a few minutes ago, he came up with this concept while in an m and concept uh, meeting, and the incentives were misaligned. So providers, whether they were medics, uh, critical care flight nurses, emergency physicians, et cetera, were incentivized to intubate their patient on the first attempt. That really was the goal. That was the metric. If they were unable to do that, they were getting dinged and uh, uh, rulers on the knuckles, right? But that took the physiology out of it. It was not necessarily benefiting our patients, which is, of course, our main goal, is to improve patient outcomes. So peri-intubation hypotension, again, Dr. Chuck Shepard incepted this concept, hopefully, into you guys this morning, and we're going to dig in a little bit more. The, uh, our fantastic foam ED friends in Life in the Fast Lane have talked about the mechanisms underlying peri-intubation hypotension. And of course, we're going to consider the underlying disease process of our patients. Uh, inadequate resuscitation, right? Just like we said, there should essentially be no such thing as a crash intubation this day and age. We really have to uh, approach our patients who require an advanced airway with the resuscitationist mindset. All sedative agents are going to have some cardiodepressive effects. And for those of you guys who were at CCTMC last year, uh, I spoke about our research on ketamine in pre-hospital RSI. Uh, especially for septic shock patients, we found incredible benefits in shock index when using ketamine as a induction agent. But ketamine also can potentially have negative inotropic effects at higher concentrations. Decreased venous return. So uh, Dr. Frederick this morning was talking about intrathoracic pressure, which we'll dig into a little bit more this morning. But as soon as I put my patient on positive pressure ventilation, our venous return or our preload is inherently going to decrease, right? That is the physiology. We anticipate that happening. And of course, the hemodynamic effects of worsening acidosis and apnea. 
So this was a study in 2012 done uh, at the Carolinas Medical Center. It was a retrospective cohort study, and they found the incidence of peri-intubation or post-intubation hypotension to be 25%. So that's a staggering number. And I know that I've experienced this personally. I intubate a patient, uh, and they get hypotensive, sometimes really, really hypotensive. And again, that sphincter tightening occurs. Has this uh, happened to anybody before? Have you all noticed this? Yeah? So approximately 25% of patients will experience some sort of peri-intubation hypotension, and you will not be surprised to learn that your in-hospital mortality goes up even with those transient dips in blood pressure, right? So they found that their hospital mortality uh, increased from 17% to 33%, so almost doubling. Peri-intubation hypotension has a significant effect on our patient's outcomes. Length of stay also increased from 17 to 11 days, or rather the opposite, 11 to 17 days. So it is a privilege to care for sick patients. That's why we have to train like we fight and have the tools, the skills, and the mental clarity to appropriately resuscitate our patients, which is why I sincerely hope that anybody that uses a laryngoscope is also using a checklist when they approach uh, RSI patients, right? And this is from Dr. Weingart's uh, a checklist, which is obviously freely available on mcrit.org. And the reason I honed in on this is if you note the fourth bullet point is plus minus push dose epi. He talks quite eloquently about the hop killers. So not addressing or uh, mitigating the in, uh, insufficient hemodynamics of your patients will result in worsening outcomes. Not addressing uh, appropriate pre-oxygenation, worse outcomes. And obviously we have also spoke this morning about unrecognized acidemia in our patient, worse outcomes. So it's 2017, right? RSI has been redefined to resuscitation sequence intubation, but more so our skill set is expanding. So delayed sequence intubation is something that is happening right now in the state of Texas in Williamson County by Dr. Jeff Jarvis, who's a paramedic turned into an EMS physician, who instituted a protocol uh, for optimizing the pre-oxygenation and denitrogenation of patients prior to intubation. And in some cases, they'll transport the patients on CPAP to the emergency departments, which initially caused some consternation for emergency physician providers who are like, well, why didn't you intubate the patient? Well, if I did, they may have had an adverse outcome, and they, in fact, found that in several M&Ms in Williamson County. So the medics were doing an outstanding job. Um, I had the privilege of recording this talk at EMS Today 2017, so that's going to be coming out on the podcast shortly. So planning ahead, right? Hypotensive patients, we really want to anticipate any adverse outcomes. We want to try and optimize their hemodynamics. Fluids are going to be going in regardless, but you know we may not have the time to uh, drop a level one rapid infuser, get blood going, get three liters of our 30, full 30 cc's per kilo bolus for sepsis, of course, but we're going to try and optimize that before we pursue it. So we have to dose smartly. Um, all sedatives are going to have some sort of cardiodepressant effect. Uh, obviously, for patients that are shocky, uh, ketamine is going to be my uh, induction agent of choice, but also the dose of ketamine is important. While there's no prospective literature supporting this, if you pull international experts, many will decrease the dose of ketamine by either half or a quarter from two mg per kg to 0.5 to one milligram per kilogram IV as their induction dose. And then paralytics for hypotensive patients, we in fact may want to consider increasing the dose. And of course, respond aggressively to hypotensive patients with push dose pressors. So that's what we're going to start digging into um, as we continue. In addition to using push dose pressors, it may also uh, benefit your patient to start uh, peripheral uh, agents to help or peripheral infusions to help with their hemodynamics. So talking about the history and the data, unfortunately, it's extremely limited. Why? Because the data is primarily from anesthesia. And of course, we know those are fasting patients. They are undergoing elective cases. And typically, they're not going to have inherent problems with their cardiac function, right? 
So they may have some peripheral vasodilation related to the anesthetic that they're receiving. And of course, anesthesiologists like to use phenylephrine, which is primarily an alpha agonist, which is going to clamp down our peripheral vasculature and increase our systemic vascular resistance. An additional patient population that there's a wealth of data on is the obstetric population who are undergoing spinal anesthesia. And just like as you consider a patient who has potential neurogenic shock or spinal cord injury, there's loss of vasomotor tone, so that alpha agonism is really going to help. The emergent population is going to be inherently different, though, which is why epinephrine essentially is our vasopressor of choice. And Dr. Weingart refers to it as an inopressor, meaning it's both, it both has inotropic effects, improving our cardiac contractility, but also, of course, has vasopressor effects. So talk to a little bit about the mixing instructions. We're going to take our co-dose epinephrine. One, uh, so co-dose epinephrine, right? So 10 cc syringe, which we're going to uh, take one cc out, leaving nine cc's of NS. With that, we're going to draw one ml of our co-dose epinephrine, OK? Now you have 10 cc's of epinephrine. That's 10 micrograms per ml. So we're just going to say that real slow, OK? So our dose now of our epinephrine in our 10 cc syringe is 10 micrograms per ml. So the challenge question I want to ask you, just to make sure that you're able to do mathematics, is our co-dose epinephrine is 1 to 10,000 concentration of epinephrine, right? And now we've just diluted it by a factor of 10. So our concentration is now 1 to? 100,000, fantastic. The way we administer this is uh, one, uh, what I like to do is one cc every one minute. So 10 micrograms, Q1 minute, with frequent reassessment of vital signs to optimize your hemodynamics. Phenylephrine is also potentially usable. Uh, some anesthesiologists have neo sticks, which are premixed uh, uh, vasoconstrictive uh, agents. But ep phenylephrine primarily is going to be alpha. So in 2016, another North Carolina study, the utility of push-dose vasopressors for temporary treatment of hypotension in the ED. And they spoke about the history, the indications, the best practices of push-dose pressors in the emergency department. And it was published in the nursing, uh, Journal of Emergency Nursing. So if we look at epinephrine, the mechanism of action is going to be both alpha and beta agonism. The onset for both agents is going to be really quick, one minute. The duration is going to be approximately 5 to 10 minutes long. And the dose for epi, epi is going to be 10 micrograms. Interestingly, phenylephrine, the dosing is uh, different by a factor of 10. So phenylephrine dosing is essentially going to be 100 micrograms. So just be cautious with that. And then you can certainly repeat every uh, several minutes. And just a quick graph as they showed, the uh, beta 1 of epinephrine is going to increase our contractility and potentially increase our heart rate and the phenylephrine does not have those effects on heart rate, and it does not improve our cardiac contractility. So talking about the pros and caveats, right? So co-dose epinephrine is readily available. Everyone has co-dose epi, without a doubt. The dosing is incredibly straightforward, 10 micrograms per ml. And the benefit of this is pumps are not required, specialized tubing is not required, you don't have to prime, et cetera, and it's within everyone's scope of practice. Now, the caveats are a dedicated person is required to mix and administer the agent. Um, if your transport is greater than 5 to 10 minutes, you may need more than one syringe of your co-dose epinephrine. This, as Dr. Jason Beck was uh, lecturing on earlier, is not a substitute for volume resuscitation for your septic patients. And extreme caution with labeling, right? Epinephrine, we know, potentially can get confusing because the units are confusing. There are a lot of zeros, right? So extreme caution with labeling. These sorts of uh, sheets are available everywhere uh, and for free. So you know, if you get some of those Avery uh, label printers, you can print these right up. Uh, if you make a special mixture, try and label it immediately so you're not accidentally flushing your patient's IV with uh, your push dose presser. This has been a myth that's been extensively debunked in resuscitation. Do phenylephrine and epinephrine require central access? The answer is no, if you have certain best practices, which we'll review. We talked about our dilution, right? So 
lidocaine 1%, the concentration of epinephrine is 1 to 100,000, which is the same concentration of our push dose presser or push dose epi, right? And I've injected 30, 40, 50 cc's into patients or uh, infiltrated into their subcutaneous tissue without causing compartment syndrome. So we really have to just be understanding that this is a safe practice. We do it quite commonly. More so, for everyone that uses epinephrine for anaphylaxis, the dose that you're giving is 300 micrograms of epinephrine, okay? 300 micrograms. Each cc of your code dose presser is 10 micrograms of epinephrine. So there's a lot of margin of safety for this. So we have to approach this with the best interest of our patients while mitigating our own individual fears. So the rough guidelines for prolonged peripheral use, and this may be uh, applicable for extended transports and certainly within the ED and as the patients are transitioned to the ICU, well-functioning proximal 18 or 20 gauge IV. The blood pressure cuff, of course, has to be located on the contralateral arm. The IV site must be inspected every hour, right, for signs of extravasation, which is the uh, feared complication of peripheral vasopressor use. If, if the patient is awake, ask them if they're experiencing any discomfort, and then always have additional access in case your IV does infiltrate so you can transition your presser to an additional line. Uh, the antidote for uh, epinephrine in the subcutaneous tissue is fentolamine. So why is this important? We talked about the incidence of peri-intubation hypotension being 25%. What this study found was of those patients who have peri-intubation hypotension, two to 5% will degenerate into cardiac arrest. And of course, as you might guess, that's going to worsen your patient's outcomes, okay? Now, the number one predictor for cardiac arrest was an SPP less than 90 millimeters of mercury, and the odds ratio was staggering. It was 3.67, right? So if your patient's SPP is less than 90, they have more than a 300% chance of peri-intubation hypotension and cardiac arrest. So if you haven't had a patient that's gone into arrest while you're intubating them, knock on something solid, you are very lucky, let's keep it that way. Let's do our best to keep it that way. So this was a paper published in 2015 in the Journal of Emergency Medicine uh, from Ohio State and the University of Arizona, and it was essentially the first evaluation of the use of bolus dose phenylephrine for hypotension in the ED. And prior to this, we had no data on push dose presser use in the emergent environment. Now, this is a dense graph, but the salient statistic here is vasopressors were given concomitantly with phenylephrine treatment in over 70% of patients, which means push dose pressors are part of the solution, but your patients may certainly require further vasopressive support as you continue their resuscitation. And they found with the use of peripheral uh, phenylephrine as a push dose presser, their vital signs or hemodynamics improved by 20%. The SVP went from 73 to 90 on average, and the diastolic blood pressure improved from 42 to 52. So approximately 20% increase in the hemodynamic support of our patient. Next study, the impact of push dose phenylephrine use on subsequent preload expansion in the emergency department. And they similarly found that push dose pressors could be titrated to effect during the resuscitation. However, many of these patients required additional vasopressor support. And one of their important takeaways was uh, using pressors can never be a substitute for appropriate volume resuscitation. If your patients are suffering from distributive shock, they're septic, you must give that full 30 cc per kilo bolus. The push dose presser can be a bridge or adjunct to resuscitation, but should not come at the expense of volume resuscitation, nor as a substitute for vasopressor infusion. So these are a couple of slides that I wanna include from my friend, Dr. Craig Ellis, who is a New Zealand emergency medicine physician and EMS medical director. And in New Zealand, instead of calling 911, if you're in trouble, you call 111. So he designed a study because the transport times were long, 30 to 60 minutes in his uh, catchment area and it was one milligram of adrenaline into a liter of normal saline at a rate of approximately one cc per minute, which was titrated up or down to clinical effect, okay? So no pumps, 
This is ground 911 pre-hospital, 30 to 60 minute transport times, no pumps. And he had over 3,500 cases and the adverse outcome rate was 0.2%, which was staggering. 0.2%, essentially negligible error rate. And there were some cases where the entire bag of epinephrine ran into the patient and there were no adverse outcomes. So the indications that he used it on was septic shock, anaphylaxis with hypotension or airway obstruction, and life-threatening asthma. And in terms of the effects, we find that the reduction in status code, or code status rather, was significant, especially for asthma and anaphylaxis. Patients significantly improved. Vital sign parameters improved significantly. And especially for anaphylaxis, they had a resolution to normal vital signs with the initiation of the low-dose epinephrine infusion. Thus, if we are planning an RSI for a patient that is in a shock state, we're already gearing up for our push-dose presser. We have our 10 cc syringe ready at 10 micrograms per ml. What am I gonna do with the rest of the epinephrine? Maybe just grab a liter of NS, inject the remaining co-dose epinephrine into that, and I essentially have a one to a million concentration of a low-dose epinephrine infusion that I can either hang or have on backup as needed if my patient gets more hypotensive. Okay, what is wrong with this patient? Fluid overload, okay, fantastic. We have some focus, focus gurus in the back, right? So the image on the right is a uh, thoracic ultrasound and these, both these images are acquired using our phased array probe. What we're seeing are B lines, or if you see those lines extending through the entirety of the extreme, uh, uh, screen, are suggestive of pulmonary edema. Now, if you look at the image on the left, the thing that's in focus is our left ventricle, okay? Now, you may not have any echo experience However, we know that a normal EF is 50 to 60%, right? What percentage would you say that this left ventricle is contracting? Very little, right? <laughs> Thus, we have pulmonary edema, low EF. Our patient has decompensated heart failure, right? Management. And this is where we're going to get into push-dose nitroglycerin. So your standard nitroglycerin dose is 200 micrograms per ml. And that's 50 milligrams in a 250 ml solution. Typically, it's D5 water. So this was a initiative I helped institute in New Jersey State, push dose nitroglycerin for decompensated heart failure. And I'll just quickly read through the indications. So immediate preload and afterload reduction required for effective decompensated heart failure. Imagine this. Your patient is committed to you are providing excellent ALS care, critical care level care, your patient's already on some sort of positive pressure support, whether that be BiPAP, CPAP, or endotracheally intubated. How challenging is it to throw sublingual nitroglycerin tablets at them, or even to spray? Next to impossible, right? That's not ideal care. Nevertheless, IV or IO solutions of nitroglycerin can be given in a serial bolus dose strategy to reduce afterload as well as preload. Now, I'm gonna challenge you guys more. We have to do some math, okay? But I promise you, we can do it. So I told you that your standard nitroglycerin infusion concentration is 200 micrograms per ml, okay? 200 micrograms per ml. Thus, two mLs of that solution is how many micrograms? 400 micrograms, yes. Now, what is the dose of your standard sublingual nitroglycerin tablet? They're the same. How cool, right? I, I never thought about that. The same. So two cc's of our standard nitroglycerin infusion is the exact same dose as your sublingual nitroglycerin tablet. Why is that important? Would you believe me if I told you that sublingual bioavailability is very similar to IV bioavailability because the oral mucosa is highly vascularized Drugs that are absorbed through the oral mucosa directly enter the systemic circulation, bypassing the GI tract and first pass metabolism in the liver. So when we have our patient who is on CPAP or BiPAP, we've significantly reduced their work of breathing. Why not use push-dose nitroglycerin to bridge them to a nitroglycerin infusion? And really, the concept here is a bridge, right? So we have critically ill patients. Of course, if we have the capability, we're going to start a nitro drip, but that takes time. 
Our patient may be 220 or 240 over 120. We've all seen those extremely hypertensive CHF patients that literally look like they're about to drop dead, right? We've all seen those patients. Why not, if we're able to establish IV access, we improve their work of breathing with uh, positive pressure support, use now IV nitroglycerin as a push dose to help mitigate their afterload. Now, if dogma to Hollywood is getting touched by an angel, then it follows that dogma lysis is preventing your patients from drying prematurely. So keep those angels away, unless they look like Matt Damon, in which case he can take me wherever he wants to. <laughs> the research on this is also sparse, but really what I'm trying to emphasize here is when you look at the dosing, it makes a lot of sense. So this was a study, use of nitroglycerin by bolus prevents ICU admission in patients with acute hypertensive heart failure. This was October 2016 in the American Journal of Emergency Medicine from Detroit, 400 patients over a five-year five period. They stratified their patients into three categories, those that received intermittent boluses of IV nitro, those that received infusions, and those that received a combination of those two therapies. And so interesting, of those patients that required bolus, they had the lowest amount of ICU admissions and the least amount of hospital length of stay days, whereas the combination group, of course, had the highest ICU admission rates and the greatest length of stay. But you'll say, well, Dr. Arshad, this is a retrospective study. There's, of course, selection bias because those patients were sicker. Yes, I completely agree. There's huge selection bias in this study, but... Let's take this as a proof of concept that we can certainly use push-dose nitroglycerin to rapidly reduce afterload in our patients with decompensated heart failure. Another study used in much higher doses of nitroglycerin. They gave two milligrams of nitroglycerin Q3 minutes for up to 10 doses, right? So we're talking about nitroglycerin boluses of 400 micrograms. In this study, they gave two milligrams of IV nitro as a push dose, Q3 minutes, up to 10 doses, and they found that they significantly reduced uh, requirement for BiPAP even, certainly intubation, and then just sort of broad strokes that MAPs were decreased, heart rates decreased, respiratory rates decreased, oxygen saturation increased, and the overall work of breathing of the patient significantly improved. So this is not an anti-pump talk. This is a pro-resuscitation talk. Pumps are an important part of the critical care skill set. However, rapid evaluation of the patient with meaningful interventions performed expeditiously saves lives. Quick uh, public service announcements. If you guys are having major FOMO, fear of missing out, I know a lot of people I've encountered on the elevator, I'm like, oh my gosh, are you going to the third floor or the second floor? There are two talks that are going on which are awesome. There's a podcast for that, right? So every single day at the end of the conference, a bunch of us get together and record podcasts on the entire day in the talks. So check it out and share it with your friends. We have to give love to our friends like we're talking about. So check out EMS POCUS. They're fantastic. They're helping disseminate point-of-care ultrasonography in the pre-hospital and out-of-hospital sphere. Wolfpack, you know who you are, coming in hot every single day. Can't stop it. This has nothing to do with push dose pressers, but I kind of wanted to do it.
This is SMAC coming up in Berlin in the end of June. So if you have availability in your schedule, certainly t uh, check this out. There's an in incredible band of international resuscitationists that are coming together to help educate and teach, and that is going to be epic. And thank you so much for your time. It was an absolute uh, pleasure and privilege speaking with you today. If I haven't met you personally yet, I really look forward to it. Thank you so much, guys. Phase on our shot. Folks, we really hope you enjoyed that lecture by one of the nation's best pre-hospital educators. Now, we have to remind you, this was just a little taste of everything that CCTMC offers. There's nothing like attending CCTMC in person. So let's kick it to our IPP, our immediate past president of AMPA, Dr. Chris Fulagar, to give you all the details for CCTMC 2018. This last CCTMC was, I think, the best one we've ever had, and I'm really excited about 2018. So mark your calendars now. It's going to be April 9th through the 11th, 2018, at the Wyndham San Antonio Riverwalk in San Antonio, Texas. We're also going to be having our pre-conferences the weekend before, so keep those dates open. Look out for the registration link, and I hope to see you there in 2018. Chris, these pre-conferences are amazing too. So if folks have attended CCTMC but not come the weekend before, we definitely encourage you to check that out. This last go around with Dr. Jack Davidoff as a medical director, the surgical skills and cadaver lab were just incredible. I've never participated in an anatomy and procedural program like that anywhere in the country. Yes, it is something that we continually get very positive feedback from and something we continue to work on each year to make it better and better. So lots to check out there, folks. Mark your calendars. You do not want to miss CCTMC 2018, San Antonio, Texas. And with that, this is Faison Arshad and Chris Fuligar wishing everyone a safe tour and a happy EMS week.